Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Sunday edition of Thursday Church, and I am glad you're here. And I'm not going to pretend and I'm not going to lie. One of the things that we talk about here is we are always honest with you. I am exhausted. I'm so exhausted. My, I, I never wake up to an alarm because I always wake up before the alarm, but today... I woke up to an alarm and hit snooze. So uh, we, are, we are glad to be home. The 10th mission trip in nine years, because one year we did two, 10th mission trip in nine years is in the books. And um, yeah. And the cool thing about this particular trip was out of the 40 who attended, 20 were first-time mission trip people. That's huge. That's exciting stuff. And it's exciting stuff because after you experience this opportunity of surrendering a house to a family who has absolutely no way to, to ever, ever in their lifetime, in 10 lifetimes, build and buy this home, and we get to give it to them. When you get to experience that, those 20 who this was their first experience to, to be a part of something like that, I have no doubt that many of those 20 will, will be repeat mission trip kind of people. Even if they don't go to a third world country ever again, they have this, this call to serve missions put down into their heart because when your eyes are opened like that, it's, it's a game changer. It's, it's, it's a life changer. There's some exciting things about missions that I want to share with you that, that uh, we did a few statistics while we were on the airplane. Well, I didn't. Barry did. But, um, so we did a few statistics yesterday. And um, while we have built and given away uh, 20 homes, and that's amazing. This is our, our wall of homes right here. This is that picture, the pictures. We'll put, um, we'll put uh, two more up there um, this week, but, but 20 homes. And um, out of that, that 20, we, we think that, uh, because we can't, we don't really know, we, Pastor Jason wasn't on the airplane with us, so we don't know how many helped build in Bicknell, but we're going to guess at least 20 to 30. Is that true? Way more than that? Well, we'll go with 30 then. That means 181 people have, 181 different people have taken part in building these, these 20 homes that's a lot of people. And what's more amazing than just the fact that there was 181 people who, who have uh, some on multiple occasions uh, helped build those homes, they surrendered out of their own pockets the funds to build those homes. So when you look at that wall, that's not church dollars. Those are, are dollars that are surrendered from these people who said, missions happens to be my heart. And, and $341,000 have, 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 have been spent and given away. $341,000. $60,000 on top of that has come from the Fort Sackville Project. So this church-owned business, when you donate the clothes that you don't want to wear anymore or the household items, and we turn around and sell those things that you're calling junk and someone else is calling the treasure, when we do that, then that has enabled us to help fund this work. By next year, we will top, top half a million dollars given to missions. And that is an amazing footprint and, and we knew that God was asking us to give big. That's why we created business, because we knew that we didn't have the means to do that. And we fundraised to, to go on these trips, because we don't have the funds to do that. But, but we surrender this, and we say, Lord God, here is our offering. And in every single circumstance, on every single job site, God has a way 
of reminding us that it's not about our sacrifice, has a way of reminding us it's not about, about us or about us getting a pat on the back. He humbles us, and he, and he does that in a very real way, in, in very, very vast variety of ways, but, but he humbles us because he wants us to be reminded that he's the one with the power, he's the one with the strength, he's the one that deserves the glory, and he's the one that we need to keep our eyes on. It's not like we have this big prize up here where we get to say, we did that. It's where we get to say, God did that in spite of, in spite of, in spite of trials. And I, I was thinking this was going to be the year without any trials. It just doesn't work that way. There are, are trials and, and over the years, we've gone through all kinds of them. One year, we built without any shade, 110 degrees, without any shade. I thought I was going to die. We, we, we have, we've experienced all kinds of things. And next week, I want you coming back because I want you to hear, I want you to hear from, from these folks and how God has reminded them, humbled them, that he is the one that gets the glory, that he is the one that in spite of, in spite of, he used us anyway. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And literally, that's what these weeks do for me. It's a reset for the whole year. This humbling experience that, 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 that I could not do this on my own. I was telling Rosie before the service, every year, um, one of the things that uh, uh, on the job site is this, it's called the concrete bag. And in the concrete bag are these big heavy stakes and um, there are some brushes so that we can brush everything off uh, after we've used the concrete. And, and um, what else is in the concrete bag? It's heavy. A sled, oh yeah, that's what's in there. This sledgehammer, it's a little one, but it's heavy. And every year I've been able to pick the concrete bag up like this, even though it's heavy, Ugh carry it. This year, I leaned over to pick up the concrete bag, uh, and it didn't move. And I thought, oh my goodness, they've put more things in the concrete bag this year. <laughs> Had to use two hands this year. Think, you know, and, and God just humbles us. He's reminding me that, that, that I'm not as strong as I used to be, and that was, that was kind of a shocker. And he's changing the way we think. Our mindset, and not just, not just as we are physically changing, but spiritually. This, this, this call, I never have picked up the concrete bag and said, Lord, I'm going to need your strength for this one. Boy, I did this week. This is a heavy bag. Lord, I need your, I need your help. I need your strength. He's going to think, the, change the way we think. And when he does that, then we know. We, we know his good and pleasing and perfect will. And, and that's our prayer as a church. That we're not going to copy the customs of the world that says, we did something mighty. But we are going to say, God, we, we, we want to stand before you. Your will be done and, and we want you to be honored. Next week, come back. And not just here. If, if you li live in the North Knox area at the Bicknell campus, uh, there will be four people sharing up there. And, and um, so here or at Bicknell Thursday night, we're going to be talking about what God has been doing. This week, we're going to talk about a passage that we studied a couple months ago. And it's in, it's in Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 19. It's page uh, 834. And um, we started studying this passage, but, but by the time we had uh, gone through all the introduction part, I really didn't get to tell you the last part of the story. I didn't, I didn't get to finish out that particular teaching and, and the, the powerful lesson that we need to think before we speak. That there's, there's great importance and value in, in thinking before we speak. And, and this story is a perfect example. You know, when it comes to the words that we use, you know, words are one of the most powerful tools uh, that, that we have. They are. 
Words can bring joy. Words can bring pleasure. Words can bring excitement. Words can, can give hope. Words can give direction. Words can give encouragement. But words can be damaging. Words can be hurtful. Words can actually crush someone's spirit. And, and controlling the words that come out of our mouth are extremely important. And, and this particular work camp, that was, that was on my mind constantly. That, that the words that we speak have such power. And in this passage that we looked at a couple months ago, King Herod is having this big birthday party. And it is a huge bash but it is for a very limited crowd. It is for the movers and the shakers. And this particular party is, is, is for those people that, that uh, Herod wants to impress. And so Herod is going to use his words without thinking. And he's going to use his wor words to, to look important, to feel important. He's going to be flashy with his words. He's going to be bold with his words, but not in a good way. He's, he's doing this to, to impress and here's one thing that I want you to remember. Whenever you're using your words to try to impress someone, you're going to walk away feeling like a fool. You're going to feel foolish. Because while, while you might feel a big and bad for a minute, whenever you're trying to impress someone simply with your words, you're going to walk away uh, looking foolish. And that's what happens in this particular uh, passage. So um, in our world, birthdays are a big celebration, and, and, and they're, they're, they're important to us. But in the Jewish culture at this time, birthdays were not celebrated. You didn't do that because it drew, drew a attention to yourself. And, and that was considered dishonoring God when, when you would say, I'm having a party for myself. So any party that was ever for yourself to celebrate your birth, to celebrate who you are, that was looked at as being arrogant and prideful. And, and the Jewish community just didn't do this. But it's Herod's birthday, and Herod isn't a, a Jew, even though many in his kingdom are. And, and he's going to have this big, flashy party. And, and he's going to think. Uh, he's going to speak before he thinks. Okay, if this sounds familiar, it should. Boy, I hope it sounds familiar. Here we go. Uh, verse 19. So Herodus held a grudge against John, and she wanted to kill him. This is John the Baptist. But she had been unable because Herod, this is her husband, Herod feared John and protected him, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man. The king recognized there was something different about John the Baptist, that this man was righteous, that this man, this man was holy, that this man had a connection with someone that, that, that Herod, Herod didn't know. He didn't have a connection with God, but he realized that John had something that he didn't have. And, and Herodus, his wife, was a bitter woman. She was a, a, a hateful, spiteful, a bitter woman. And, and she could not stand John the Baptist. And she wanted him dead. And, and so as we revisit this text, what I'm hoping you find is, is her perspective and her outlook on life. And why she was thinking the way she was thinking. And it all goes back to three letters. Sin. So verse 20 goes on to say, when he, this means King Herod, when he heard John's words. So this meant that the king was listening to John. And John didn't come to the king to talk. The king would have had to place himself, place his carriage or, or somehow so that he could hear John as John spoke to the people. But he's perplexed by John. That's what we, he, uh, uh, he's greatly perplexed. Yet he listened to him gladly. On Herod's birthday, her opportunity arose. This is Herodus, his wife. Herod held a banquet for all of the nobles for the military commanders, as well as all of the leading men in Galilee. These are the movers and the shakers. These are the important men. This wasn't a co-ed party. I want you to get that. Even though there were women there. This was a party for men, while men 
This was a party for men. Okay. When the daughter of Herodus, the daughter, came and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. Oh, everyone's listening, all of these important men. And Herod is saying, this young, gorgeous woman is, is pleasing us with her dance. I will give you anything you ask for. And the other guys are, wow, that's powerful stuff. Impressive, Herod. And, and, and he swore to her, whatever you act, ask of me, I will give to you even up to half of my kingdom. And then she went out and she asked her mother, what should I ask for? And Herodus answered, the head of John the Baptist. And at once the girl hurried back to the king with her request. I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter immediately. The king was overwhelmed with sorrow. But because of his oath and his guests, these big flashy words, speaking without thinking, wanting to impress those around him with his power, with his ability to, to sound so important. He did not want to refuse her. So without delay, the king commanded that John's head be brought in. He sent an executioner who went and beheaded him in the prison. The man brought John's head on a platter and presented it to the girl who quickly gave it to her mother. And then John's disciples, when they heard about this, they came and they took his body and they laid it in a tomb. A foretelling, almost, of what is yet to come for Jesus. Um, so a little clarity here, and I know I told you this a couple months ago, but, but now we're going to complicate the relation thing a little bit more, a little more depth. We're just going to keep learning. The King Herod we're talking about is not the King Herod of Jesus' day. He is not Herod the Great. They are related, father and son. But um, this is A.D. 29, and this is Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas goes to visit his half-brother, who is half-brother, that means they have a different mother, half-brother, Herod II, who is also known as Philip. But don't confuse that Philip, Herod II, with Herod Philip over here, who has the same mom and the same dad as Herod Antipas. Getting confused yet? You should, because this is a mess. So, over here, we have Herod II, also known as Philip, and he marries his niece. Now, this Herod Antipas goes for a visit. And, and these men were all important men. Uh, Herod Philip was the governor of, um, of the land, let's see where, uh, area east of the Jordan. So, these are important men. I don't know why everybody had to have the name Herod, but they did. So, so I just want you to understand, Herod over here governing east of the Jordan, even though he's called Herod Philip, we're not messing with that Herod Philip. This is Herod II, known as Philip. They have different moms, different, okay. So here we go, and then here's Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas goes for a visit to his half-brother, and he sees his half-brother's wife, who's also his niece. And he lusts after her. And she is a very smart woman. We can't explain how this woman had so much power, but I'm going to guess that she knew how to, to work men. That's what I'm going to guess. Because what she tells Herod Antipas is, as he see, she sees that he, he likes her, she's married. And he sa she says to him, if you will divorce your wife, I will marry you. She's married already. She was so certain that she could convince 
her husband to divorce her, but she was not going to be part of a harem. See, the king can have as many wives as he wants, but she didn't want to be part. She wanted to be the one and only. And she said, get rid of your wife, and I will come and be your wife. Now, the fact that she only had a teenage daughter probably says that there was some stress between her and her husband because they didn't have birth control. She should have had a lot more kids than just this one daughter. And she's kind of bitter on her husband anyway. And what we see happen is Herod Antipas does exactly what she asked. He gets a divorce. And he sends his wife to the curb. And she convinces Herod II, also known as Philip, to divorce her. And now they're going to get married. She knew she had an upgrade. She didn't just have a, a, a leader. Now she had the king. And she knew that she had upgraded. She had, she had, had this king. And they're going to live happily, happily ever after in the palace. Except for when we walk in sin, it will always complicate things. And you see, there were a lot of people in, in the land in which Herod ruled who were not impressed with the way he was handling himself, not impressed at all, and they viewed this relationship as sinful for very many reasons. First, because he divorced his wife. Second, because he took his brother's wife. And, and, and that was illegal. You could not marry your brother's wife unless you married her under what is called a leverate law, which simply meant your brother is deceased, and now his children have become your children because you have married his wife so that your family can be blended. And they didn't have this understanding of, of half or stepchildren when, under um, Lever at Law, when you, when you married them, you, those children were joint heirs with your children equally. And they were your children, not stepchildren. They didn't believe in stepchildren. But now, here in the palace, we have a stepdaughter. This is very problematic because her father is still living. And add to it, her father happens to be the half-brother of now her stepdad. And the Jewish people were not impressed the Christian people were not impressed. And John the Baptist said, I cannot be silent. You see, as we talk about the power of our words, sometimes we leave words unsaid that need to be spoken. Sometimes we aren't bold enough to say, what you are doing is sin and it's wrong. And, and John said, what you are doing is sin and it is wrong. And, and, and your example for this kingdom that you are leading. It is a bad example. You are a leader. And you are walking in sin. And this is wrong. And boy, Herodus couldn't stand it. And, and she convinces Herod Antipas to throw John the Baptist in jail. And so, so there he is sitting in jail. But Herod was interested in what John had to say. Because John spoke of this Messiah. John spoke of this Savior. And Her Herod assumed he was the Savior. He, he spoke of himself as he was the one of power and of authority. And, and he wanted to hear who John the Baptist was preaching about, this, this man named Jesus. And, and so... Uh, They've got this relationship going on. And my guess is, once John the Baptist has been thrown in prison, from time to time, he would have someone bring John to him, and John would speak into Herod's life. Because it says that he was perplexed by the words that he said. So it's not like he just heard him once. I can't, I can't imagine that. I think he heard him several times. So here we get to this point where now it's Herod Antipas' birthday. And, and he rolls out this, this big honking party to honor himself, to make him look important in front of his friends. And he invites 
He invites those that he wants to impress. And he is imitating what the Romans and the Greeks of his empire or his kingdom, what they would do. Because the Romans especially like to have parties to honor themselves. Now there's this division here because the Greeks and the, the Jews and the Christians, they don't believe that way. And so, so he throws this big party, this big showy party, so that he can impress the Romans and the Greeks. And as the party gets underway, there's an awful lot of alcohol consumed. And we know this by their behavior. And we know this because this was the kind of party that was taking place here. And you know what happens when you consume too much alcohol? You speak without thinking. You speak without thinking. Lesson number one, liquor is not your friend. My kids laugh at me because I call it liquor. It's like, like, have you had liquor? You know, them. Okay. liquor is not your friend. It's not. It will cause you to say things and do things that you would not normally do. Your inhibitions are lowered. You see, as a king, he had an entire court around him all the time. And before he would speak, he, he had this court that made sure that what he was going to say was proper. And that's why he didn't just speak publicly. Normally, it would, there, you would come to the court, you would address the king, and the king would talk to his, his court, and then he would, would, would reply to you. And that was normally how things happened, except for this party, something has changed here. His court is no longer protecting him. Why? Because I think they've been in the liquor. Because, now, now, now you, can, you, can, you don't have to agree with me, but something happened that caused his court not to behave like his court. No longer were they protecting him. No longer were they making sure that his words, because his words are his oath, no long, longer are they helping him now. He's on his own, and he's spouting off, and someone should have pulled on his robe and said, sit down, king. we got to talk this through. You can't give away half the kingdom. You don't own half the kingdom. You rule over the kingdom, but the kingdom's owned by all these. You can't give it away. It's not yours to give away. What are you doing? Normally, everything that the king is going to share publicly was discussed. But not this time. Something happened differently. You can figure out for yourself what it was. But we know that there was, there, that, that, that there was dancing. And along with the dancing came the alcohol. And so here we go. Alcohol. And we're not talking about a little wine here. We're talking about a lot. Because for these people who were his protector to, to not be on their game and realize that they had a job to do while they were at this party, my guess is there was a lot a lot of alcohol flowing. Inhibitions are down. So publicly, he makes this oath. And the law is that when the king speaks, whatever he says is law. Whether you agree with it or not, whatever the king speaks is law. And it must be carried out. Number, lesson number two from this story is, do you have people in your life who are speaking truth into you? Do you have people who are speaking truth and telling you, you know what, you're off base here. You, you need to, to adjust, to make an adjustment here. Well, the words that you are speaking are inappropriate. You are dishonoring not only yourself but God. This is immoral. This is wrong. Do you have people who are bold enough to, to speak that into you? And I'm going to tell you, the more authority and power you have, the harder this will be for people to speak into your life. So if you are a position, in a position of authority, you especially need to be making sure that you have inroads for people to speak into your life. Because it will be hard for people, if you are a person of authority, to speak into you with, without feeling as if they have overstepped. So here's the king, and, and he's very important. And he has these people who are to be speaking into his life, and something has happened. Something's happened, and, and the wheels fall off the bus here. Do you have people who are willing to speak truth into your life? And if they are, are you listening? 
Are you listening to what they are saying? See, now Herod, now he can't lose face. He can't lose face in front of all of these people that he's tried to impress. He finds himself speaking without thinking. He finds himself no longer surrounded with people who are helping him. They're there. Do you find people, are there people in your life who can speak truth into you? So you see, um, somebody uh, did a devotion uh, this week, and they talked about, I think, is it Paul Harvey who says the rest of the story? Yeah. Okay, so, so there's, there's more to this story. The, the, the rest of this story is that um, often, when we speak out of turn, when we speak without thinking, it's because of pride. And so lesson number three, pride will keep you from recognizing the truth. It will keep you from recognizing the truth. Herod had heard the truth from John. But pride and arrogance and this desire to impress took over. And here is the rest of the story. Herod and his wife Herodias are shamed because the Jews and the Christians believe that the beheading of John, they believe that, 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 that it was wrong, that it was sin. And, and Herod, his army is now defeated just a few short years later. And the Jews said this was divine punishment for what they did to John the Baptist. And not only was Herod's army defeated, soundly defeated. But Herod and Herodus, Herodus were banished from the kingdom. And they were sent off to the region called Gaul, which is modern-day France. And, and in this territory, they had no power. In this territory, they were sent away because they were shamed because of their actions. They didn't seek forgiveness. They didn't make restitution. They didn't say what we have done is wrong. What they did was they conti continued on this road of sin. And, and, and the people said, this will not do. And so, so here they are. And now not only are they banished from their kingdom, but then Herod Agrippa, he's another Herod, he, he gets to take over, over leadership of the, of the kingdom. This week, as, as you read, I want you to read the last part of Mark chapter 6. Because this particular party that is a disaster, that ends in death, um, this particular party is, is um, butted right up next to another, another party that is extremely different. And this is a party that, 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 that Jesus, you would call him the head of ceremonies, I suppose, of this particular party. At this particular party, uh, over 5,000 men were fed, so we know well over 10,000 total, with two little fish, five little barley loaves. And at this party, anyone was welcome. Not just the movers and the shakers, but men and women and children the poor, the wealthy, the educated, the uneducated, the healthy, the sick, anyone was welcome. And at this party, Jesus spoke into them truths that they were so hungry to hear. And at this particular party, God was honored. And, and, and as we look at these, these two stories right next to each other in, in, in Mark chapter 6, there's this great contrast. This party was to honor self. This party was to honor God. This, this party said only a few are important enough to take part. This party says this is for anyone, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like. And, and as we look at, at, at the guest list, restricted, open, when we, when we look at the, the differences of these two stories, so, so different. We have to ask ourselves. I mean, smack, dab in front of us are a couple of questions. Which party would have you attended? Which gathering 
What have you wanted to be a part of? What authority figure are you listening to? Are you listening to the world and all the flash? The things that are going to make you feel important? Or are you listening to God Almighty who said, I created you to be important? I have a plan for your life and that plan is good. Which gathering do you find yourself in? As you look at your life, what are you gravitating toward? Where are you going? How are you spending your time? What party? What party would you attend? Because the party you attend will reflect the words that you are probably speaking. See, at this party, they were probably not just Herod Antipas. They were all trying to impress their cell, each other. Have you ever been to a place like that? Where you're sitting with people and they're all sitting there trying to impress each other? And they're all talking about how wonderful they are? And you're sitting there going, eh, really, none of you really impress me. The words that we speak have great value. And the words that we speak will dictate to everyone who we are and where we fit best. I hope you fit best in God's kingdom. I hope you, you fit best honoring the Lord with your, with your talents, with your time, with your words. And I hope that you have people who are willing to speak into you in such a way that instead of just agreeing with whatever you are doing, they are willing to say, hey, take a step back. Take, take a closer look at this situation. Let's rethink this. This is a powerful, powerful piece of writing. And I don't want you to just read the story about Herod Antipas. I want you to read the story about Herod Antipas right next to the story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I want you to ask yourself, where do you gravitate? 